you've known Jordan Peterson since before kind of all of the rest of us kind of got to know him, I guess. Yeah, it was a strange, it was a kind of strange coincidence of events. I met him in 2015, um, or I, I heard of him in 2015, and then I, I connected with him about six months before the whole thing started to, to kind of fall apart, like everything started to explode. And my, it was strange because when I met him, when I heard him, I felt like, like he, he understood the types of things that I was asking myself, like the types of questions about how reality exists and <clears throat> about symbolism. And so when we met, um, I felt like there was one thing I had to tell him. It was so weird because we, we right away, we could see that we could, we could understand each other. And um, there was, I, I just felt like there was one message I needed to communicate to him, which was because he talked about this notion of the monster on the edge of the world and the idea of the, of the dragon and chaos kind of on the edge of reality. But I, 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 I felt like I had to kind of tell him that that monster also exists between categories. Like mm -hmm. it, so it's not just that it exists on the edge of something, but that the world exists in this hierarchy of levels, let's say, and at the edge of each rung of the hierarchy or also in between opposites, there is a buffer of, uh, of chaos and uh, which kind of protects the, uh, which both, which can both threaten, but also protects the in integrity of uh, identities, right? So you need a kind of a, a buffer of uh, exceptions, a buffer of, um, of uh, things that don't quite fit on the edges of things, because that's, that's what helps you, kind of like we say, the exception is the rule, right? It helps you to see the identity, but then it, it, if you're not careful, it can actually start to eat at the, uh, at the identities. And so I was trying to explain, like, that's what, uh, that's why we have cherubim, you know, in the temple between the holy place, uh, the holy of holies and the holy. And that's why we have, we have gu uh, guardians on the outside of holy places, right? That act as this kind of buffer uh, of chaos. Um, and we talked about also the idea of the, um, the threshold in a lot of cultures. You're not supposed to step on the threshold. If you, if you enter someone's house, you have to step over the threshold. Like to step on the threshold is, a, is considered a very dangerous thing. And it has to do with this idea that there is no definite place where the inside and the outside of a, of an, of a house is, right? You can say right here, like this spot where I'm showing, this is exactly the place where the house and the, the outside and inside are because it's not something about quantifiable, it's not quantifiable but there is a difference. And so the threshold acts as this buffer of chaos, which is neither inside or outside. Don't touch it, leave it alone. You know, let, let the monster be, just, cr just step across it. And then you're on the inside and you know you're on the inside. So that's what I kind of felt like I had to talk to him about. And then it was so strange that it was, that it ended up being this, this like idea of, of, a, of a identities that aren't quite, don't quite fit into the normal male, op, female, female opposite. That's what exploded. Stepped on the threshold. Exactly. And so he ended up, well, it's more that the threshold started to manifest itself. Like it's like the monsters, which are in a way supposed to protect the identities started to turn on the inside and started to devour the, the categories. You know, you see that in a lot of stories where like I, I talked, I talked about the idea of the troll on the bridge, right? So mm -hmm. the troll on the bridge, he, he protects, he stops you from crossing, right? He's there to prevent things that aren't supposed to cross across, but then he can also start to devour things. Like he can start to actually eat at, at those things that want to cross over. And so it's a, it's, a, it's like a, that's the amb ambiguity of the, of the margin. So anyway, so I felt like I had to explain that. So then after that, when the Pepe thing kind of came about, then I knew that, okay, we need to talk about this. Uh, and then since then, like, I feel, I feel like Jordan, he kind of, He's kind of seen me as an ally in certain things, like not everything that he does, but in certain things that he does. And so he'll call me usually very frantic, you know, because he, he thought of some crazy connection and he, can't, he couldn't say it publicly because it would just look insane if you just said it publicly, but he just needs someone to bounce it off. And so then we'll talk it out. And, and so, so that's kind of been my, my relationship with Jordan. So when you explained that thing to him, was it something he had thought of before or was it completely new? I, I think it's one of those things where he hadn't thought about it explicitly, but as soon as I said it, it was like, right, it clicked right away. It fit right away into the way he sees, sees the world. And, and that's kind of the, I think that's what happens with symbolism too. Some of the things that he says, it, it does the same to me where I hadn't quite thought of it in those categories, but as soon as he says it, it just kind of right away, you know, intuitively that it's right. And so that was the, that was kind of the relationship that, that developed right away. And then after that, it felt like, 
that's always been kind of our discussion is that he'll say something and then I'll say something and we're both kind of like, whoa, you know, look like two stoners, you know, kind of discovering the, the world. And so it's, 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 it's a lot of fun. That's for sure. Yeah. So, so that's how that's, and then when it happened, I think obviously when it happened to him, then it really became real, you know, and, and, and so he started to see this whole idea of the, of chaos, uh, uh, in that way as, as a, the idea of also this notion of deconstructing, like how postmodernism also plays a role that's similar because that's what Jacques Derrida, that's all he talked about was how these uh, indeterminate categories, they can deconstruct the categories. If you, if you play with them in the right way, they can turn on normal opposites and, and, uh, and actually kind of uh, not invalidate, but like make the normal categories start to slip and then you can't, nothing, nothing is stable anymore. And that's kind of, that's kind of how we feel like things are going on right now. Like the world is kind of in that, that weird space right now. So I wonder if there's some of the ambivalence that I see and sense with Christians and Jordan Peterson, because one, he doesn't identify himself as a Christian, but he's also explaining Christian stories in a way, sort of using the psychological mainly. Is there a sense that in a way he's, he's sort of potentially explaining them away for some Christians. Like in a way, if, if, if you've explained them, why do you need belief and faith in the same way? How do you, how do you see the, the relationship between sort of traditional Christianity and what Jordan Peterson is offering? Yeah, I think I keep saying, I, Jordan is obviously not a Christian. Uh, like I even said, like Jordan is obviously a heretic. Like with the things he's, a lot of the things he says are, are completely wild. Uh, but I think that, I think that, the way that he's talking about things, I think that the way that he's talking about, about uh, these stories, uh, first of all, it's not that new. It's, it's only new. It's only new for kind of weird uh, literalist type uh, Christians in the United States and in North America, especially. Uh, but, it, but it's not weird at all for traditional Christians because this idea that there are, first of all, different levels of meaning in the text is very traditional. This, this notion also that the, the, the Old Testament is there to show us uh, certain moral structures and kind of ways of interacting that can teach us lessons about how to live our lives. Uh, I mean, that's obviously very, that's very traditional. I think that Jordan has found a way to, to talk about it using neuropsychology, using the psychology of attention, using also evolutionary biology that is definitely surprising people because he's able to connect you know, research in psychology to, to, uh, to how the stories lay, them, lay themselves out. And I think that that's been really fascinating for people. Um, and, and I think I, what I've always said is I think that the fact that Jordan is not Christian is actually extremely helpful right now. Because, I think people would stop listening to him immediately exactly. if he ever said that he was. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's like, I, <laughs> it's like I, I say explicitly that I'm a Christian like it's part of my upfront identity. And because of that, I know that there's a, there's a limit to how many people are going to listen to what I'm saying. I've accepted that. Like I, it's something that I've decided to do and I've accepted it. Like, because he's, he's, a, he's acting as this weird kind of in-between figure, he, he doesn't, he's not threatening to people. They, they, don't, they don't feel like he's gonna try to convert them. Like they, they feel like the discussion that he's having is honest and genuine and he's actually trying to work this stuff out and the truth is he really is trying to work this stuff out jordan has when jordan says when he doesn't answer the question like do you believe in the resurrection of christ if when he doesn't answer the question do you believe uh in god it's because he's really is trying to figure it out for himself he's not he's not it's not a it's not a, a theater move that he's doing like he he you know i had a <laughs> I had a discussion with Jordan just a few weeks ago where he, he, he called me and we started talking about, about Genesis again and attention and this hierarchy of attention and everything and how, how God gathering the dust and blowing his spirit into the dust is the same structure as how we basically encounter the world. Like we gather in this potentiality, then we, we infuse meaning into it. And he was like, and then he said something, he said, he said, oh, he said, it's so terrifying to think that these stories could actually be true. And I was like, what? And so I said, I'm like, what do you mean? Like, what do you mean it's, it's terrifying? He said, well, what do we do? What do we do if they're true, you know? And so it's like Jordan is actually, he actually is working through this stuff. He's not pretending. And I think that's one of the reasons why pe some people have been so genuinely interested in what he's saying. Uh, he's no different in private than he is in public. Like, this is what's happening. I think that 
the Christians, most of the Christians that have reacted neg negatively to him have been the kind of Calvinist types, the, the kind of uh, the, the, the more rigid, uh, are you saved? Are you not saved? Like that kind of Christian. Uh, I think they're the ones who have been reacting more to him. I think that most other people have just accepted that he, first of all, he's not a Christian. He's not saying he's a Christian. Uh, and, and he's just there. I always talk about him as, as a kind of, a, as a transitional figure. He's a, I always say that he's like King Cyrus. King Cyrus in the Bible, he, he's the one who sent the Israelites back to build their temple. Like he wasn't an, he wasn't an Israelite. He didn't believe in God. Like he, he had all these idols and he, and he, he was, he was a, man of you know a powerful man but because he he was able then because of that he was the one who was able to say like hey you know why don't you go back and that temple that you had you know is there's something interesting there was it interesting you you should do that you should go back like go back to your thing uh and because of that there have been i mean i've been witnessing to myself like there are thousands of people that are going back to church like at least, at least hundreds of people have written me personally emails talking about how they're kind of rediscovering their Christian faith at a, at a different level. They kind of move past the, the, uh, the 13 year old version of Christianity and they've discovered something more, more powerful. And I keep telling them like, that's what Christianity is. It's all, that's always what it's been. Maybe not, obviously not the evolutionary biology stuff because they didn't talk about that stuff. But the notion that these, that these stories manifest these ways of being and these, these manners of, of encountering the world and ha that it has to do with consciousness and has to do with our, 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 uh, our experience of the world. Like that, there's no mystery. Like that's really what, what it's about, you know? Uh, so you can, you can easily go back to church and then, and then discover that. Now it doesn't mean that when you go back to church, you're only going to encounter people who, who understand that. Religion is a hierarchy. Like the way it's set up, it's a hierarchy. It's it's there. The way the stories are told, they're they're supposed to be able to engage and touch the dumbest peasant, right? And at the same time, engage and touch the scholar, the 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 scholar of religion, the the the, the philosopher. Okay, but you can't expect everybody to have the same level of understanding. So if you go to a church, you're going to encounter someone who has a very direct, very literal, very uh, kind of in-your-face vision of what those stories are about. And you shouldn't be surprised about that because that's for everybody to fit. It's like, let's say in the Sam Harris version of religion, he would be able to enlighten everybody so that everybody understood the higher meaning of religion and nobody was attached to the like the kind of more immediate lower version of of, 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 of believing stuff. And it's like, that's not going to happen. Some people are never going to reach that. Some people are never going to reach that level. It's impossible. You, the reason we're talking is you got in touch with me to talk about organized religion, um, which is a subject I'm, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on. It's a kind of a common, the kind of common story for the last few generations in, in the West. I grew up in a Protestant kind of Baptist uh, background, um, very, very conservative, I would say, like, a, you know, conservative thinking, a lot of creationism, all that stuff. Um, luckily, my, my father was a very intelligent person. He was a pastor, actually, for, for a part of my youth. And he was, very, he was a very curious and very intelligent person. He always encouraged inquiry and encouraged deeper thinking. So the, the whatever fundamentalism I was getting was mostly getting it from my surrounding, not, not necessarily from my family. Uh, but I kind of had this in university, I started asking a lot of questions and I started uh, seeing the limits, let's say, of, of, um, of where I was coming from. And I started to discover the same as you. I started to read texts from Eastern traditions, from read uh, more, you know, kind of Gnostic type texts. And I thought, okay, what I could understand what they're talking about, like what they're talking about this, this uh, transformation of the person that salvation, the way it was presented to me as a, as a, as a child that's there as a young person was you believe in Jesus, right? You, be, you believe in Jesus and then you're saved. So it was like a believe in Jesus and you get this ticket, you know, you die, you go to heaven. Like then I, then I read the, the, the mystics and I realized, okay, that's not what it's about. Like, that's not exactly what it's talking about. It is talking about this transformation of the person and the notion of ascending into heaven. It is, it's a transformation of the person to become, uh, to be free from the, uh, let's say the, the things that hold us down, like our passions and, and uh, you know, our, our belly and all those things that kind of hold us back and, and our, our thoughts, all of that needs to kind of to, to, uh, 
to fall away and then to enter into that silence, let's say that the inner silence and the, uh, this, this, uh, this transcendent place that we can find in our heart and that, that God can interact with us. So I was like, okay, that's awesome. And, but at first I thought, at first I thought, okay, well, why is it that it doesn't, why is it that I find this in reading, you know, uh, Hindu texts or reading Gnostic texts or reading uh, kind of weird, weird texts, but it's not in Christianity. Why, you know, why is that the case? And uh, then I realized that it was in Christianity. It's just that no one had ever taught me those, those traditions. Uh, and then I discovered the church fathers and I discovered uh, um, the, the mystical Christian tradition, hesychasm, uh, especially the, the, the tradition of the East. That's when I discovered uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa and uh, St. Maximus the Confessor, St. Gregory Pal- Palamas, this whole line of, of mystical teachers that, that uh, are in the Orthodox tradition. And that led me finally to convert to orthodoxy where everything is seen through that mystical lens. And so the whole purpose of everything we do, even all the rules that we have, they're not just simple moral rules of you should do this or you shouldn't do that, but they're, they're just basically tools to help you move into your heart and encounter Christ and be illuminated by Christ. Um, and so that was kind of my, my uh, path. And in that I discovered the symbolic language and uh, and how the symbolic language had to do with this notion of I talked about kind of entering the heart in terms of a person but you can do that in terms of of your experience of the world and so the world actually comes together and starts to shine like things start to be brighter than they were before as you see uh, things come together uh, in 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 the logos you could say like I think people who are listening to you will now start to know what that what that means. It's not just gobbledygook, right? Um, and so that that's kind of what led me to uh, to where I am. Um, and so for me, the discovery for me at, at, in terms of organized religion, I think that in order for all the levels to be stacked up properly, you know, because you one of the things that is still accessible to most people today is this idea of the personal mystical experience, right? But the difficulty with that personal mystical experience is that if it's proper, right, it also has to, to stack at the, the next level, but it also has to bring communities together, right? It can't just be on an individual level because it, it has to line up with the way the world exists. And so if you, if you, if you start to have, uh, let's say intuitions, mystical intuitions, or you start to have that process of, of getting rid of these passions that you have and kind of moving in, then that also needs to happen at the communal level. And then it has to have, it, it has to have a social equivalent or else it's not real. It's not totally real. And so I think that that's why for me, in, in the end, there had to be a religious aspect to it. Religious and really in the sense of uh, of a place where you go and you are in communion with other people, the same way that you're able to commune your thoughts together in your heart. You have to, re- that has to happen again at a social level. And ideally it has to happen at a kind of universal level where those churches also are communion with other churches. And that kind of creates this body, which is in Christianity, we call the body of Christ. This kind of this, this cosmic body, you could say where everything kind of comes together. Um, and so it's like, I think that we can do that. We can kind of engage in, in, in Christianity in the body of Christ without being naive, right? Without being naive and not understanding that just like in myself, I have all these things pulling me in all these directions, that I have all these crazy thoughts, that I have all these crazy desires, that I have different personalities sometimes that manifest themselves and I start to act in these weird patterns. So too, on a social level, you have the same problem. You have perversions that set themselves up you have power struggles that set themselves up all this stuff happens at at the church level and so i think it's it's incumbent on us not to be naive about it not also to just accept it but also not to be scandalized by the fact that that happens because if it happens in me it's going to happen at the other level too like i'm not i'm not you know i'm not fully illuminated let's say i don't know if that makes sense yeah i'm I feel the the first bit you were saying about sort of the transformational aspect of of, of the experience is something I I resonate with because I've done a lot of personal growth work, which I now feel like I understand at a deeper level because I'm now framing it within okay, the more I speak my I speak my truth, the more I align myself with the logos, the more the more I simplify my being in some way, the more I kind of have this. 
I'm able to live that out in my own life. And I'm, mm. I'm able to frame a lot of the work that I've done, which was probably offered more within a new agey kind of framework within a slightly deeper, well, well, much deeper Christian framework. Yeah. Um, but I also, Paul van der Klee said that you were quite skeptical about Jung because, because I would say Jung maps onto that sort of transformational aspect of, of, of growth um, and, and religious experience. I think, you know, it's weird. I, I keep telling people, I haven't really read Jung that much. Like I've read the, the, the little bit of Jung that everybody's read when they're in college or whatever. Uh, like I haven't really studied Jung very much. I think that the reason why I hadn't, I had never studied Jung is that I feel like he, he, he makes, well, he, he's kind of like Jordan. It's weird. Cause I, it's like, it's like, I like Jordan because I know him and, and, and we, and we agree on a lot of stuff. It's like, he comes up to the psychological level and then he kind of stopped there but maybe i'm wrong that's the feeling that i get uh is that i feel like the step after jung is to realize that that is really how reality is in an objective way that is like you know you see for example jordan does this thing like he did this thing in the sam harris debates where he talks about the spirit of the father coming up like this notion of the spirit of the father being kind of elected by the people who elect the high, the, the, the sense of the leader. And then that keeps going and going and going. And that comes up. And then we have this image of the father in heaven. Right. And then it's like, that's it. That's yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. But then at some point you have to realize that that's the reason why that happened because that's actually the shape of reality. Like you, you were not, we're not separate from reality, mm. right? We're not separate from that process. Like that process it, it, in order for it to, to have happened and to, to persist, like it has to manifest something about the real world. Like it has to manifest something about, about how reality is structured. And so then for me, it's like, then you can, to me, it's not a, then it becomes not a problem to say, I can say my father, our father who is in heaven. And I, and I can just say that. I don't have to do all the psychological work behind it anymore. Like I don't have to kind of convince myself about all these steps about how the spirit of the father emerged out of all these different, da, 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 da. it's like, I can just say our father is in heaven. And I know that that's the truest way to encounter the, the infinite power, let's say the, the, the infinity of, of generation of the, uh, of the infinite generating person. And I can, I can say that. So to me, it's, I always felt like Jung, kind of stop there. Uh, and I think that one of the problems I had with Jung too, is I think I felt like he was, it's not his fault. Totally. He was in the 19th century, early 20th century occult, like the kind of occult uh, thinking where it was really, it was that strong sense of Christians got it wrong. Christians didn't understand what they were doing. It's like here, I'm going to show you like what it really was. And also that's why I kind of get hung up on Gnosticism. It's like, Jung also did that too. It was like, oh, the Gnostics got it right. The Christians got it wrong. And then here we are, you know, poor us. We were like, the, we, if the Gnostics had, had won, like we'd be so, more enlight, so much more enlightened. I think, that that, I think that's, that's, that's the wrong way to go about it. And I think that it's subversive in the end, that it actually ends up, I think that Jung, in, in, in the manner to which he acted that way, he, he participated in the, in the fragmentation of, of the social fabric, let's say, of the West in, in trying to, because we see it, if you want to know the way to destroy Christianity, we've seen it happen in the past 10 years where every year there's some new weird fragment of text that they find in the desert. And then they tell us, here's this new fragment. Like it's revealing us the real truth about, about Jesus that we've ignored for the past 2000 years. If only we had had this, this weird fragment that we found somewhere in underground in the desert, like we would now have the, all the wisdom. And, and I think that that's a, that's a subversive uh, element. It's really there to constantly break apart what the, the social cohesion. So I think that that's, that's has, that was my problem with Jung, but you know, I, I, I have to be fair. Like I haven't read, I haven't read enough Jung to, to be, and that's why I haven't actually never, I've never been openly critical about Jung either. I've always kind of distanced myself from him, but I've never been openly critical about him because I don't know enough about him to, uh, to really be able to say, uh, even I probably what I've already said might be wrong because I, I know what I know from secondary sources and stuff. I, I guess you're you're saying it's kind of almost like explaining Christianity away rather than explaining Christianity. Is that is that your sense? I, no, I would I I I don't know if it's explaining it away. It's like I think it's 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 um in a way it's a kind of it's a kind of sign. It, 
I don't know if it's a kind of scientism, but it's a kind of, it's a kind of manner to say that reductionism, if, if we can find the psychological mechanisms by which these things happen, then we don't need the, the metaphysical, let's say, instead of seeing that the psychological structure is manifesting the structure of reality. Right, it's 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 mirroring the structure of reality. So reductionism would be a better. Would, maybe that's a way to see it. Yeah, maybe that would be a way to to say it. Which is sort of what the, the materialists do by saying, well, it's just, um, it's just chemicals, or it's just by, it's just, it's just well, th yeah. there's no need, there's no need for the word just in that. Yeah. Like, yes, it is chemicals, but how is that not necessarily representing another reality or another reality, and that all of these realities are stacked? It's sort of yeah. it's, it's a judgment of what you're making your primary lens, and then assuming everything else is is should be seen through that lens, rather than saying, well, there are multiple levels, and and that and things are manifesting at all of them. Yeah, because we don't we don't experience love as a bunch of chemicals in our brain. If you do, uh, yeah, like get you in trouble. We experience love in the realm of of language and consciousness and relationship and. And, and, and if you try to reduce that to the chemicals in your brain, you're not doing justice to the experience of that. You're, you're, and, and, you know, I, I think that that it brings us back to the discussion about Sam Harris that we had, that we had uh, before where uh, there's a, there's a podcast where he talked with, a, I forget who it was. He had a podcast about this notion of how reality stacks, like how, you know, emergent, they call it emergent phenomena, right? How, how uh, things clump together into identities, right? At higher levels, because it's not just a quantum field. Like we don't just experience it, but in the end it is just a quantum field, right? It is just in terms of material substrate, it's just a quantum field. And so, but then how do these different levels of reality uh, stack onto each other? And Sam kept wanting to, he's kept saying, I want to explain it with the lowest common possible thing, but that doesn't make sense because, you know, like millions and billions, like there's millions of atoms in your hand and there's no point in explaining it with those millions of atoms instead of explaining it with the dear like i'm thirsty i'm going to drink a glass of water explaining it through the realm of consciousness uh and i think that that's yeah that's 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 the thing is that just because you find the material causes of something doesn't mean that you've eliminated the mm -hmm. the higher realities uh i think i think it's to me, it's so obvious, but I, I guess a lot of people aren't able to see it. But it, to me, it's so obvious. Like I can both say that the music that I like comes from my my iPod, you know, but also comes from I don't know, like Kanye West or whatever. Like, and and I can also say that Kanye West is manifesting, uh, you know, uh, certain immutable patterns of of relationships that make it so that I can like that music. And so it's like I don't have to eliminate. I don't have to say, well, I know I've, I've discovered the secret of music. It's coming from my earphones. <laughs> I've got, I've got it. You dumb people who think that music just moving particles. Exactly. It's like, it's all you dumb people who think that music has meaning. It's like, it's all moving particles. Yeah. yeah I could just imagine a, a music review uh, page that was just like every single, every single album was, it's just moving particles. <laughs> just moving particles. That's right. That would particles be are in a slightly different way to the other ones. Exactly, and it's and and certain chemicals in your brain have been. Uh, we were able to see which section in your brain is is uh, is uh, is uh, is active when. Like by Kanye West. Yeah, exactly. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that, yeah. The, the problem is that that's what you find. I mean, that's what you find in, at least in a lot of the people that I've encountered that are so against religion. You know, they say things like God doesn't exist, and and I think, well, you know what? If you think that exist means that you can hold it in your hand, you can touch it and feel it, then yes, God doesn't exist. Fine. That I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Like if you think that if you, even if you think that it means that you can contain it, even conceptually, then yeah, God doesn't exist. Right. <laughs> because God, the whole idea of God in the, in the Christian tradition and in all the monotheistic traditions is that God is uncontainable, that God is beyond all concept, all name, all representation. And that not that the representations are arbitrary, that they help you to kind of get closer to to the to the mystery, but that but that that God is not a thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's really hard to argue with an atheist who wants you to prove that God exists, like he wants you, like he wants you to prove that you know that that uh, that tree has fallen in the forest. Like you can't. It's not the same kind of proof. <laughs> even, even even existentialism starts from that perspective of realizing the language we are using cannot encapsulate the thing we're trying to explain. Yeah, because. 
everything by definition, language is going to be a subset of it. Any representation of everything is going to be a subset of everything. Yeah. Therefore, it cannot, it cannot be articulated. Yeah. But I think that the proper way to see it, at least, at least like in a, from the Orthodox perspective, uh, we have this idea, we have these two visions of theology. One is called apophatic theology and cataphatic theology. And apophatic theology means this denial, right? This saying that, that, that God is beyond all name, all definition, right? That you cannot encompass the divine in, in uh, language and images and whatever. But then the other aspect is that because of that, everything actually does manifest the divine, right? So one of the problems people have, one of the problems we've seen in postmodernism, especially is that they'll have this apophatic move where they'll say something like, you can't represent reality. Reality is beyond our capacity to represent it. And then they make this weird move where they say, therefore, it's all arbitrary, right? All our structures are arbitrary. Our social structures are constructed. They're all arbitrary. But that's not the right move. The right move is then to see that actually all of reality then flows out of that mystery and actually points in a very fragmented way, but points towards that unsaid mystery. And so that's what lays out the hierarchy, right? That's what lays out the hierarchy of being is, is both those moves where you say it's something beyond, but then everything is manifesting that beyond and it's kind of, it's kind of flowing out of it. Uh, and that, that, that's what helps the, it helps avoid, it helps avoid the absurd aspect of, uh, of existentialism, in my, in my opinion, at least. I'd love to ask you, because I heard we interviewed Paul van der Klee recently, and he, he said something along these lines, I think after the interview, that it all comes down to the resurrection. That, and I think he may have sent me a quote, or I may have seen a quote that said, if the resurrection didn't happen, then every Christian is, is a fool, or something like that. Do you, un do you understand what that means from a... From a um, theological perspective well i mean yeah i think i think that for sure the, the christianity hinges on the resurrection mm. i think that's that's for sure uh i i i think that how can i say this i keep telling people to be a little bit careful when people think that they know what the resurrection is i don't think it's that easy to to know what the resurrection is I always tell people I believe the resurrection is an event, and I and and I think that the text describes that event both in a very experiential way that the people who were there experience experience the resurrection in an, in in a very extreme way. The tomb was empty, you know. There were these encounters, but it's it's also not that simple. It's not as because people people think that the resurrection just means a dead body sitting up and walking out, like. That's not how it's described in the text. Christ hides himself in the resurrection. So after the resurrection, Christ manifests himself to, to these people and they don't recognize him. And it takes a long time before they actually recognize uh, Christ uh, in his resurrection. Um, and so I think that, that, that in the story, it's important to see that it was deliberately put in the story that whatever the resurrection is, is not, is not, obvious it's not an obvious thing and and sometimes people who want to reduce the resurrection to some kind of some kind of uh resuscitation right like some kind of someone passing out and you do cpr on them and then they sit up and then they cough out you know their whether it's in their lungs or whatever like i think that that is an that is a very uh that's a very naive way of seeing it. And some people can see it that way. It's fine. But I think that we shouldn't reduce it to that. We should be careful not to reduce it to that. But I do agree that the resurrection is the hinge of, of Christianity and the resurrection has to do with the idea that the world is essentially can participate in God. That's what the resurrection means. The resurrection means that the created world, the manifest world, the, the world of phenomena can embody can be a house for the infinite and can manifest the infinite uh and so it redeems the world right it makes the world participate in in uh in divinity and so 
if you look at the the last image in the in um, in Revelations, like you follow the whole story, the last image in Revelations, I think I keep telling people that's the image that, to help you to see what the result of the resurrection is in the end, and it's this it's the the new Jerusalem, the the heavenly Jerusalem, and what it is, it's a it's a garden in the middle, the Garden of Eden in the middle, and then the city around it. And the city is made glorious, right? It's gold and jewels and everything. So it's, it's represented in a glorious manner. And so both the natural world, the natural world contained, but then also all of human activity, all of technology, all of human knowledge, all of the extra building that, that consciousness can do, and the body, right? The, 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 the actual physical world can be can participate, can be, can be transformed, can be full of light, right? Can, can be transfigured. How, I don't know how else you want to say it. And so, and so that, that has repercussions which go beyond, which go beyond our, our very immediate experience of the world. Like, how does that link to the mystical experience? Because what you're describing it is- It is a mystical experience. It's the same thing. It's, yeah. it's, it's exactly the same thing. So if you look at the same... So the resurrection, the idea that the mystical experience of, of oneness, transcendence, kind of the world glowing from within, interacts with the world in a real way. That's right. That's exactly what it is. And, and, and that's exactly what it is. And so when you, when you read the, uh, the, the saints, when you read uh, several of the mystics, they talk about how the resurrection is accessible already, that we can already participate in the resurrection of the body. That it's not that it is something which is at the end, right? And it's important that it's at the end because it encompasses everything. And so it 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 happens at the end of the world, at the end of history, at the end of you know time, whatever how you want to say it, because it is the final thing. It's the thing that encompasses everything. So you could see it as encompassing the whole world, but you can see it also as encompassing all of time. Um, and so that's why it's important that it's represented eschatologically, that it's represented in the future, in the final revelation, let's say. But what it is, the cosmic participation in the, the mystic's experience. It is a cosmic version of what the mystic experiences in his illumination. And that's exactly what it is. And, that, and, and I can say that without a hint of worry that any at least orthodox theologian is going to come in and slap me on the wrist because that's really what, what, uh, what it is. Um, it also sounds pretty psychedelic. I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I've never done psychedelics. So I don't, I, I, all I know are the, the, the traditional versions of this. So I don't know about the psychedelic one. <laughs> yeah. I've just, I guess I've discovered like this world of psychedelics with Jordan. He always kind of, sometimes he kind of freaks me out when he, when he talks, he tells me things like he's, I had this vision and he told me his vision. And it's funny because his visions are always quite coherent symbolically, you know, uh, and so I can, I can tell you like, oh, it's connected to this, 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 like I can show them what it's connected to, but it's just funny to think that they're due to mushrooms. So it's kind of, yeah. kind of like, it's weird. <laughs> yeah. Was there, was there anything that we, we haven't discussed yet that you'd, you'd like to, to cover? I don't know. I, I, I think I, maybe I'd like to kind of hear your take or your vision, let's say, of what are the challenges or the, the opportunities of organized religion? Like what do you think are the problems and what do you think, what, what, or how could you see it in negative and positive uh, terms, let's say? Um, I mean, it's clear that the, the absence of a space and a reason to, to come together is, is something that's really, we're really lacking in society. A, a friend of mine created something called Sunday Assembly. I don't know if you've heard about it's a, it was an atheist church or is right. an atheist church. Yeah, I've heard of those, yeah. Um, so he, he's a um, stand-up comic and together with another stand-up comic friend of the, his, they, they was like, well, why do, why do only people come together for, for religious things? Why can't we create this as an atheist church? And the interesting thing is, and I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn for him here, is that they, they created it as an atheist church and it's become more and more um, spiritual as time's gone on, like they've, it, it, it's, it's developed its own kind of, um, they realized how insufficient atheism was as a kind of organizing principle for a community to come together. Right. Um, and it, it sort of developed a, a bit more of a kind of a, a spiritual tone as time's gone on. But I certainly feel in myself that 
that lack of an organizing principle. And that just, there's, there's also something about, like I went to Paul van der Klee's service in Sacramento quite recently. And what I realized is, and I think this is something to do with our tribalism. We need, we need a context to be able to let our guard down. Mm-hmm. There's a sense that when we all go to church together, because we all tacitly acknowledge that we have the same value system, that we have the same objectives, that we're here for the same reason, it allows you to, to talk to anyone there. Like you, you immediately drop the, ba- drop the barriers. Yeah. Whereas almost in pretty much every other social situation, apart from maybe a festival, um, like a really good festival, and not, that doesn't always happen, we always have these boundaries between us and them. We need something to allow us to, to connect with others. We need an excuse or we need a context so, so that's what I think, for me, that's what I realized when I went to Paul's church was, oh, okay, wherever you come from, you can go into one of, maybe an AA meeting might give you the same experience. Like we all, we need this shared context to be able to get over our, our um, yeah, our, our, our innate tribalism, I think. And that's what, for me, I recognize. And I don't know whether it's possible to have that without, I think you'd have to have a religious framework of some kind for that or a shared a shared value system of some kind mm-hmm. um i don't know whether you're sort of suggesting that we need a a renewal of traditional christianity or traditional religion and i i kind of have some sympathy with that but i also have a sense that probably for my generation and younger if there is something that that kind of fills that spiritual void that we're all feeling that it's probably going to look somewhat different from from what we've seen before mm. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how, yeah, how it, how it works out. I kind of, <clears throat> I think that I kind of see it in a long, in a long term, like I see it in a long uh, story. Um, and so I, I, I already see, let's say, to me, the, 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 the Reformation for me was already kind of a problem in terms of what it did to the West. It's like, I think we're the product of, of this kind of breakdown. I think one of the, the difficulties is when when the highest value that a, that a society is turned towards, when that starts to change, like starts to fragment, uh, you can maybe hold on to the, you can maybe hold on to the smaller communities. Cause we still, we have those small communities, right? I mean, we have, uh, you could, like you said, it could be an AA meeting. It could just be a knitting group. It could be an old ladies who go get together to knit, right? They have a common thing which unites them and makes them into uh, a little community. Um, and I, but I think that, in order for larger, in order for like, let's say, all of society to have some form of capacity to interact, there need, we need to agree on the highest, let's say, uh, or at least work as hard as possible to agree on the highest. And I think that that's what, I think that's what the church offered, let's say, the West for, you know, like a thousand years, let's say, uh, and, and it was actually the only thing like in, in Western Europe because Western Europe was so dark and so convoluted and there was all these wars and all these barbarians coming down and everything. The only thing that made it even to something like that made it somehow one was the, was, was the fact that we could at least all kind of agree, you know, this is what we're aimed towards. You know, the, 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 the incarnation is at least what we're aimed towards. Um, so I think that, I mean, it's probably idealistic for me to, to, to think that that's what we would need, like something. That's why I tend to, to, to return to, to more traditional Christianity. Um, but it's, we're in a difficult situation, for sure. I, I, I think I fear... I think I fear that those smaller communities that we, that there's going to happen, it's going to happen again, like it happened in, in the 20th century, hopefully not as bad, but that's what nationalism was, right? We, we can't agree on the highest, on the highest mm-hmm. unity. And so our, our, the one we can find that's solid is our, our national identity. So we, we kind of clumped around our national identities and then we had these crazy wars that, that you know, that were, that were nuts. Uh, and so I feel like in the wake of world war two, um, as we, you know, it's just been two generations. I always said like the last, when the last veteran of World War II dies, the last people that survived World War II, uh, it's going to happen again because we haven't dealt with anything. We haven't dealt with any of the questions that were being posed at that time. And so I think that's- I I have the same sense. It's like also that some some lessons have to be learned the hard way. 
Like if you don't have a lived experience of how bad things can get, then it's very difficult to kind of even, even think or articulate it to yourself. Yeah. Well, let's hope, let's hope not. Cause this one, this, this turn's going to have artificial intelligence in it. <laughs> Yeah. They're going to be the ones deciding where the bombs will drop. That's, that's not going to be, that's not going to be fun. Anyway, let's not think about uh, Skynet too much, but uh, I think that uh, to me, I think that that participating in something which has the possibility of, of kind of uniting things together. I think to me, that's been my drive back towards uh, traditional Christianity. Um, um, so, but I mean, like I'm Orthodox, I'm not Catholic. So I'm, I'm also somehow participating in this weird, this weird kind of fragmentation, you know, like at the same time, I, I feel like there's a lot of things in Catholicism, which are, which are off. Um, and so, and I think Orthodoxy has more of that mystical vision that I, that I, that I think is important to have as the central core. Like if you, if you have the mystical vision as a central core, then, then the world flows out, you know, in a, in a more, ordered way, I think.